It's so good to be here with my Numa family. If you're the type that likes to follow an actual Bible, Acts 17, um, we're going to get to that in just a second. If not, we've created some really easy to follow along with slides uh, that'll, make it, that'll make it really simple. Um, a couple things uh, before we get started. Um, after this is over, um, we do have a small table set up in the foyer with our resources um, on them. They're in audio and video and USBs. Uh, the reason we do that is because we live with the conviction that we're not simply called to go to heaven when we die. We're called to bring heaven to every place we see hell here. And so we use the profit from that to create a fund that helps us do missions in the world. Our mission of choice, um, instead of just giving a little bit to a lot of different things, uh, our mission of choice is we have three children's homes in China that look after children with mental and physical disabilities, two in Hinyang, one in Changsha. And so uh, since the last time I was here... Um, there's six brand new series. Um, everything you're going to see there is a series with anywhere from four to 11 in each one. Um, and you could choose the audio version or the video version. Um, it's letting me put something in your hands that will change the way you look at God. You put something in our hands that helps us feed, clothe, shelter, educate disabled children. I think that's a pretty good, um, a pretty good trade. Um, we also, five weeks ago, I'm very excited about this. Five weeks ago, we released a web streaming service app. And so um, you can come by. We, it got to the point where we couldn't take all of our resources because it's too big. So what we did is um, um, we released an app um, that's a web stream that allows you to have access to all of it. So if you just come by the table, there's a QR code. Um, you, can just, uh, you can just do the thing on the, on the QR code, um, create a free profile, and then you'd have access um, to, the, to the stuff. Uh, my understanding is, is that even if you, never, if you never used it or whatever the case may be, um, it still helps us the more people that... Uh, create a profile. So I don't understand all that, but I trust the people who do trust that, who do know these things. So if you could come by, do that. the only thing I would ask is that if you don't want anything, God bless you. I'll see you this afternoon. Okay. If you know, if you know, I'm going to go get something after this service, I'm just going to ask you to do it in the first 10 minutes. Um, the reason is, is because um, I'd love to go get something to eat uh, before I have to be back at 3.30 for the four o'clock so it's a really carnal sort of, you know, selfish sort of thing. I'd love to, I'd love to eat something. That'd be great. And, 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 so, and, so, and so my team as well. So this, this church has a real chatting culture afterwards. And I, I love that. It's better than not liking each other. But if you, could, if you could buy first and chat second, that would be the best. That'd be awesome. Um, one other thing before we get going. Um, I'd like to give everybody, if, if you, I've been coming here since 2012, and so uh, some of you have known me that long, and uh, you know that I put the most uh, important thing uh, to the evening. And the reason is because I can invite everybody in the morning back, but if I do it in reverse, I can't. And so um, I'd, like you to, I'd like you to consider, um, um, I, I just know that what's on my heart for the afternoon um, service is critical for all of us. So if you would consider coming by, um, if it doesn't change your life, I'll per personally out of my own pocket, I'll pay you back whatever the ticket costs to show up. Okay, so it's really, really, um, it's really, really risk-free sort of thing. All right, so I, I get to open the Bible today, and I take that really seriously. And anytime I do that, I want a few things to happen. I want Jesus to get bigger, the cross to work better, the resurrection to be central, and scriptures to get bigger, not smaller. I hope that's your experience um, here today. Let's start with a story. It's a true story, and this is why I wrote this message, okay? So uh, one of the things I get asked to do everywhere, everywhere now, um, is uh, Q&As, because uh, the younger generation are used to collaborative learning, right? They uh, give and take, you know, they, they don't want to just be told what to do, and, and that's, that's healthy. So, so the church is everywhere. We, we did it here at NUMA on Wednesday night um, after they, 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 gave me, they gave me 19 minutes to, to do a monologue. And then it was an hour of Q&A around that. And so that's a very common thing um, now. So I was in this Q&A. Uh, some of the Q&As are dangerous, right? So I, I was in this Q&A one time with 2,000 people. And there was a QR code behind me that said, ask him anything. And they were submitting their questions. Like, what could go wrong, right? And so... And so but one time I was in this q and it's a medium-sized one, like a little bit over 100 people. And this lady asked me a question, and I'm going to quote her, okay, because I'm really thankful for this lady because it, it helped me put this, these thoughts together. She said, Shane, I'm being tormented for my faith in Jesus at my place of work. Do you have any advice for me? Now, this Q&A is in Australia. That's important context. She's not in, like, the underground church in Saudi Arabia or something, okay? Uh, this is, like, you know... This is Australia. Nobody's being tormented at work because of their faith in Jesus in Australia. 
And yet she said, I, I'm being tormented for my faith in, in Jesus at my place of work. Do you have any advice? And I just said to her, I don't believe you. And then, of course, I let the tension rise in the room for a second. She said, what? I said, I didn't stutter. I don't believe you. I don't. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you mean to tell me that you're the first one in and the last one to leave, and you're known for having the highest amount of work ethic, the highest amount of integrity, the highest amount of compassion, the highest amount of generosity, that you're known as being a peacemaker in conflict, that you turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give your tunic and your cloak, and you readily put others in front of yourself and people don't like you? I don't believe that. She told me I helped her. <laughs> so afterwards, we had a chat. Um, because I did it soft, you know. But she, 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 we had a chat. Here's what she did, right? And let's just stop and get the plank out of our own eye, okay? Because she did something that we all have been guilty of at times. And this is what she did. She crossed a line into seeing her faith in Jesus as an argument to win instead of a life to demonstrate. And when we do that, it's untenable. Jesus is not an argument to win. Jesus is a life of love to demonstrate. I said to her, I said, I bet I know what's happened. I bet you've been weaponizing Bible verses in the general direction of people who have no emotional connection to the Bible verses. She said, I have. I said, I bet it has a lot to do with other people's private lives. She said, yes. Yes, I said, no wonder they're pushing back. You're weaponizing scripture in the general direction of people who have no emotional connection to it? Well, that's just dumb, right? And so I want to talk to you about that because Christianity is not an argument to win. It's a life of love to demonstrate. Even when we say things like, I love Jesus. I just love Jesus. What does that even mean? How do you love Jesus? What does that mean? In, in, In the scripture... Loving God is an entirely a function of how we love other people. John said it this way. Anyone that says they love God but are not demonstrating love for their fellow man, they're lying. And the truth isn't in them. So I want to talk to you about that. Because we're in a season where there's an inordinate amount of curiosity around spiritual things. There's an anthropological explanation for that. I'll leave that because I don't want to bore you. But it's, it's something that happens after every pandemic in the history of the world. And we're in the middle of it. And so what that means is people... Who normally weren't interested or now interested. And, and, and so we need to have some language on what this, what this looks like in our, in our world. So I think there's going to be three kinds of people that we'll engage with in our world. And I want everybody to resist the urge to go, man, I hope such and so's listening to this. I, I get it. I get it. Me too. I hope everybody's listening because I'm the one talking. Um, but, but Jesus said, if you, want to, if you want to really change your world, you've got to see yourself as the plank and them as the speck. Um, we, can't, we reverse that is what it sounds like. You know, we Christians are flawed, but you're really flipping flawed. Well, that doesn't work, right? The, the Apostle Paul said it this way. What business is it of yours, the immorality of the world? Sort your own house out, yeah. right? If you don't believe Paul or Jesus, how about Michael Jackson? If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a... Uh, If you don't like Michael Jackson, how about pink? I'm a hazard to myself. Don't let me get me. I'm my own worst enemy. Now look, if Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul, Michael Jackson, and pink agree on something, there's a high probability that there's a profound truth in it. So let's talk about this. Um, So I want us to find ourselves in this story. I want to give language There's three types of people. If you could bring that first slide up for me. I think some people know it, but they can't name it. They know something's going on inside of them. They just can't name it. And that's really important for us to remember. Otherwise, we'll label people. We'll see the world as us and them instead of us as them. That's two different things. Labels are for products. Love is for people. As soon as you see, I'm a believer, you're an unbeliever, as soon as you can label it like that, we'll talk down to them, and they'll lash back. Of course they will. They, they, you got, you, we got to assume that Christ is at work in all people. Whether they can name it or not is another thing. But we got to assume God hasn't given up on anybody breathing air, right? So, so some people know it, they just can't name it. Um, uh, other people, number two, they name it too loud. 
But when you look at their life, they don't know it. And that's a particular level of yuck. Some people have received God's blessing for them, but their offering back isn't very nice at all. So let's talk about these three types of people. Some people know it. They just can't name it. I think it was eight years ago. There's a guy named Sean Penn. Sean Penn was Madonna's ex-husband. And he got so moved, he sold everything he owned in Beverly Hills, moved to Haiti, and gave it to the poor. That is astoundingly inspiring. So, so when the news asked him, what inspired you to do that? Sean Penn's answer was, I can't name it. But there was an internal hum in my heart urging me to live the rest of my life for the good of others. And I had to say yes. Whew. Some people know it. They just can't name it. You see, all, you see examples all over scripture. There's this one time, there's this guy named Cornelius. And Cornelius is so theologically unsound, he doesn't know Peter's not God. That's pretty basic. He shows up to Peter and he thinks Peter's God. He's bound. Peter, you want to talk about the earliest point of discipleship. Peter starts at the most basic thing imaginable. I'm not God. <laughs> Cornelius is like, okay. Why am I here? Peter says, because God wants you to pastor the first church. What? I didn't even know you weren't God. I know, I know. But God already counted you righteous because your generosity to the poor went up as a remembrance to him. Some people know it. They just can't name it. So there's this time, there's this guy named Paul. And um, he goes to a place called the Oropagus in Athens. It's in Acts 17. I'm going to read you the story and then let's see if we can find ourselves in the story and be inspired uh, by it to change our lives. Um, one mustard seed at a time. Acts 17, it says, Paul uh, then stood up at the meeting of the Oropagus. So we got to talk about that. So he's at this place called the Oropagus. And he said, people of Athens... I see that in every way you're very religious. In other words, you believe in God, good for you, right? For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, idols, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. In other words, you know it, you just can't name it. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now, this is challenging, is it not? Would we accept this as an appropriate mission strategy at Numa Church? So, so what, if, what if part of the service today, there was a missionary that Numa supports, and he came to give an update? Give us a four-minute update of what's going on in wherever, Cambodia, wherever you are, right? And the guy's like, hey, guys, I got an amazing thing. We had this mass conversion event, and what happened was is uh, there was thousands of people worshiping at a temple, but they hadn't figured out the name of the God of the temple, so I just called it Jesus, and we'll be done with it. And now they're all worshiping Jesus. Uh, would we be okay with that? Yeah, that's what Paul's doing. There's a thousand gods in Athens. One historian said there's more gods than people in Athens. And he just finds one without a name and he goes, that'll do. Let's call that Jesus. That is bizarre and challenging. And why? Watch this. Watch this. He keeps going. Next slide. God did this so that they would seek him. And perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us. Pause. Paul's talking to an audience that's 100% not Christian. And he's affirming that Christ is at work in every single one of them. He wrote this in his letters as well. In Ephesians 1, the spirit of the risen Christ is filling everything in every way. In Colossians, for by him and for him and through him all things were created and in him all things hold together. It's, it's this, he's affirming, instead of labeling them, us and them, he's like, no, no, same Christ holding me together is the same holding you. And he's hoping you're going to reach out and find him, right? And then watch what he says, to non-Christian people. Check this out. For in him we live and move and have our being. Really? Even us? Even as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So Paul's quoting an Athenian poet to get his point across to people. He's meeting their broken story where they are and then paying attention to what God's up to. Some people know it. They 
just can't name it yet. Now, to understand this passage, we have to have a brief history lesson. If you're like, no, I hate history, give me three minutes to redeem your boring history teacher, okay? So we're going to make this scripture come alive a bit. To understand this passage, you've got to understand five things. If you bring those five things up on the screen, the five things are the Oropagus, to an unknown god. There's a guy named Megacles. We're going to talk about him in a second. Cylon of Athens. And then we're going to talk about a man named Epimenides. So let's talk through those five things in a rapid fire history lesson that's going to be about three minutes long. I'm going to speak very fast. You're going to have to pay very close attention. Here we go. First of all, the Oropagus. The Oropagus was basically city council in Athens. It's where the people got together and discussed policy and politics. Like what policies make the world a better place? And you could come and present present your idea at the Oropagus. And the question that was asked was not, is it right or wrong? The question that was asked is, is if the whole world converted to that way of living, would the world be a better place? And if the answer was yes, they started implementing policies around that. If the answer was no, they killed you. So Paul's taking a big risk here, okay? You say, man, I was so brave this week. I shared my faith with Sally in accounting. Okay, so so Paul's at this place. And by the way, as an aside, here's a question every Christian should be willing to ask. If the whole world converted to how I'm thinking about God, would the world be better? Wow. Oof. By the way, the, 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 the theological word for this is an apology. An apology, an apologetics is not an argument about what you believe. It's a defense of if the whole world was living like this, the world would be better. Pause. If the whole world started thinking how we're thinking, would the world be better? If the whole world was consumed with other people's opinion about climate change, would the world be better? Nah. If the whole world was obsessed with other people's private sex lives, would the world be better? Nah. If the whole world thought political leaders were the answer to everything instead of heart change, would the world be better? No. Nope. If the whole world became amateur predictors of doom, would the world be better? No. Nope. If the whole world got obsessed with a solar eclipse in America, yeah, because God's biblical calendar runs right through Jackson County, Missouri. No. No. So if the world, if the whole world converted to what we're thinking, the world's not a better place, that's a problem. But I'm convinced with all my heart that if the whole world converted to how Jesus saw the world, how Jesus saw God, and how Jesus applied the scripture, the world would be a better place. So Paul goes to this Arabicus, and he sees an altar to an unknown God. And he seems to just call it Jesus and be done with it. Well, how do you do that? What, is that okay? Well, to understand this, we got to go, we have a, a brief history lesson. So we got to go all the way back to 660 BC. 700 years before this, there's an Athenian king named Megacles. Now, Megacles was a megalomaniac narcissist. You'd never seen anybody like this guy. He, all of his policies upheld his thing and at the expense of everybody else, right? And he, he was not very popular. So there was a guy named Cylon of Athens. Cylon was basically the poor people's one voice in their government. It was basically, Megacles is like, hey, he'll speak for you. But when you only have one voice and it ain't working, it's a problem. So Cylon started something called the Cylonic Revolt. The Cylonic Revolt was basically, this is a caricature, he riled up all the rural farmers and all the poor people and he said, let's show Megacles a lesson, which was basically a bunch of rural farmers with pitchforks taking on a professional military. This did not go well. Megacles squashed this very, very quickly and he lied. He told him, if you just surrender amicably, I'll just make you slaves. I won't kill you which was a good deal because they were already slaves. That was all right, right? But he lied. As soon as they laid down their weapons, he used them as public examples to, to prevent this kind of thing in the future. Let me, let me explain that. He tied them up in the city center and he had wild animals rip them apart. He tied them to horses and had horses pull them apart. He put them in scafes where you're encapsulated in a boat and you end up dying from your own excrement. He, 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 he disemboweled people. He'd tie them up like this and just cut them and have their bowels pulled. He'd pull their bowels out. One historian said there was pregnant women with babies just hanging out of the... Like, it was an unthinkable thing. A, a government-sanctioned horror. Um, it, by the way, just as an aside real quick, never ever buy into the lie that the world's getting worse. It's not getting worse. Compared to when? Are you serious? 
And it, not only is it not getting worse, it's the best it's ever been precisely because of the work of the Spirit of Christ in the world. That's the Christian narrative, is that Jesus is involved saving it, not destroying it. It's the best it's ever been, and it's not even close. Like, look, would you rather be a woman today or 1950? I'm not tricking you, seriously. <laughs> would you rather be a woman today or 1950 or 1850? Is God done redeeming women's rights? No, it's better. Would you rather be black today or 1950? Or 1850. Is God done redeeming race relations? No, it's better though. Would you rather go to the dentist today or 1950? <laughs> or 1850. Today they numb your mouth with Novocaine. In 1850 they numbed it with whiskey. Novocaine's better. <laughs> Would you rather have a colonoscopy today or 1950? <laughs> oh, look. All right, buddy, just breathe through it now. Breathe through it. I know there's a little bit of pressure. Just It's just better. Nothing's worse than when Jesus lived. Nothing. Here are a few things that were legal in Jesus' day. These were legal. In the Roman Empire, legal. Murder. Legal, as long as they were lower class than you. Rape. Legal, as long as they were lower class than you. Full birth abortion. Legal, as long as they were lower class. No, full birth worship was just normal. If you couldn't afford it, you just bashed their head or left them on a garbage dump. It's called exposure. It's considered completely normal. Pedophilia, legal, as long as they were lower class than you. Bestiality, legal, as a public act of worship of the goat god Pan in Caesarea Philippi. These things were legal. People go, man, this world's crazy these days. What are you talking about? Whatever your problem is with Albo, it ain't Nero. Yeah. <laughs> Under Nero's reign, it was legal to impale people who were following Jesus. If you don't know what that is, the military held you down, they took a stick, and they rammed it up your butt. When you died from the internal injury, they then planted you. And the stick, they'd cover you in tar and use you as a human candlestick in Nero's backyard. Oh, man, you leave how bad, man, Christian oppression. What? Come on. Seriously, nothing's worse than, heck, nothing's worse than 100 years ago. Nothing. Go home today and watch one episode of 1883 and ask yourself, would you want to live back then? Nothing's worse, except pollution. Pollution's worse. <laughs> it is. Pollution's worse. That, that, that's because we invented the internal combustion engine, which basically solved world hunger, and then it created a problem. Um, and to be fair, to be fair, divorce rates are worse. We're getting more divorces now than ever before. And that's not good. It's not good. But that's just because of medical advancements. We're living so long. In Jesus' day, they died at 32. So till death do us part was more doable. Now you've got to live with them to 84. It's a whole thing. You imagine if your great-great-granddad came back from the dead and you had two days to convince him how much worse the world is these days? Imagine that. Just imagine the stuff in your house. What's that? It's a car. What's that do? It takes us wherever we want to go at 100K an hour on a paved road. What? What's that? It's a tap. What's that do? Brings clean, drinkable water into our houses under pressure. Wow. What's the other one? That's the hot water. You have hot water coming into your house under pressure? Yes. What's that? It's the toilet paper. <laughs> it's awesome. 1931 changed the world. We saw you collecting corn cobs earlier, Granddad. Not necessary now. Huh? Whoa! What's that? That's the wet wipes. What's that do? That's the thing that shows us the toilet paper isn't as foolproof as we thought. It's amazing. And by the way, if you're interested, it's going to get better than that. In Japan, um, they had a problem with too much toilet paper in their sewers. So instead of complaining about it, they invented toilet paper free toilets. Right? I know. I know. Lady at the back's like, God, that's disgusting. I know. That's because what you're picturing is one of those little French bidet things. Like, no, 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 no. You go to the toilet in Japan, you got to be sure you're done because you hit that button. It's an 80 horsepower Kubota engine on the back. It'll lift you off the seat. You're like, like, um, you can't wait to go to the bathroom in Japan. You go to the bathroom in Japan and come back and use the bathroom at the Motley Hotel. You'll think you're in Sudan or something. It's just better. 
Anyway, back to Megacles. So Megacles kills these people. And it doesn't go well. Um, a plague comes on Athens. Now, these people were very superstitious. We're not. We'd never think God was like that. Anyway, so, so they thought the gods were lashing out at Megacles' deception by hurting all the people. And so here's what they did. They went to the Oropagus, which is where Paul's standing 700 years later, and they're like, what do we do? And here's what they did. They had a problem. If you had a 1,000 gods and you don't know which one's ticked off, what do you do? Well, you've got to sacrifice to all of them. So that's what they did. They ordered a uniform sacrifice to all gods everywhere. So Saturday at 2, sacrifice, no matter what happens, right? So they do this, and it doesn't work. Everybody's still sick. So what do they do? They went and saw a Pythian oracle. An oracle was your last line of defense against the gods, right? It was people who lived in caves that were thought of to have special connection, right? I think scraggly-haired woman in a cave stirring a cauldron, like Clash of the Titan stuff, right? And so they go... They go talk to the Pythian Oracle, and the Pythian Oracle said, well, there's an unknown God, and it's him you must appease. They said, what's his name? She said, I don't, if I knew his name, he wouldn't be unknown. <laughs> you have to go consult with the great Cretan prophet Epimenides. So Epimenides is this famous Cretan prophet um, who uh, is known as a person of wisdom. He's actually quoted in our Bible three times by Paul in the New Testament. Um, even though he had never heard of Jesus. Why? Because truth is truth, no matter what banner you put it under. Um, so, oh, I have a picture of Epimenides. Check him out. Here he is. Here's, here's Epimenides. And he's something. He looks just like Uncle Jesse from the Dukes of Hazard, you know, <laughs> or Uncle Herschel from The Walking Dead, depending on your generation. Anyway, so they pay him a fee, and he comes to Athens, and he sees the carnage, and he's brokenhearted about it. And he doesn't know what to do. It's an unknown God. So here's what he does. He's on the steps of the Oropagus, and he says, I want all of the sheep pinned up over there in a, in a stony region where there's no food, and I need all the stonemasons here at dawn. So at dawn the next day, he stood on the steps of the Oropagus, and he prayed a famous prayer. It goes something like this. Oh, great unknown God, please forgive us for our ignorance of your great name. We just don't know who you are. But if you'll be kind to us, unknown God, for you are the God Almighty, the great creator, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Would you be kind to us, for we are your children, we are your offspring. Show us what pleases you. Whatever sheep grazes normally, we know that's the sheep that doesn't please you. But whatever sheep lies down despite being starved, that's the sheep that pleases you. So they release the sheep, and most all of them eat. But the ones that lie down, he says, I want all the stone masons to build an altar right where they lay and inscribe it, an altar to an unknown God. And they killed the sheep and the plague lifted. So from that day forward, the Athenians kept all their gods, but the unknown God was the creator God, the God Almighty, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Paul shows up 700 years later and says, you've been worshiping him for years. I guess it's about time you knew his name. Some people know it. They just can't name it. Some people name it too loud. But when you look at their life, they don't know it. Jesus said it this way. Beware of people who wear their tassels too long. What a brilliant sentence. You say, what is that about? Well, in a multicultural place that had been taken over a lot, your tassels were your identification that you were an observant Jew. And essentially, Jesus is like, be careful around people who would rather be known for a loud announcement of what they believe instead of a loud demonstration of love for how they're living. Beware of people who like too many titles. Beware of people who are too loud about how gifted they are. Beware of people like that. Beware of people who would rather increase their status instead of being aware of the story they're spinning. Beware, beware of people who would rather have a reputational orientation instead of a relational orientation. Hey, be careful around people who would rather be known for what they believe and their opinion about everything than being a demonstration of love for their world. Beware of someone whose fish on the car is too big. <laughs> Beware of 
of someone whose cross around the neck is too pronounced. Beware of the WWJD bracelet that's just a little bit too loud. Beware of the Christian t-shirt that's just a bit over the top. Beware of the people who share that meme on their Facebook wall because they're not ashamed of Jesus. Ah! Beware of people who wear their tassels too long. Some people name it, but you look at their life, they don't know it. So there's some elements of the Easter story. We just had Easter. Thought we could look at it. So there's this guy named Pilate. And Pilate does something very normal. He crucifies people. That happened all the time. He also does something normal. He put a sign over their head to tell people what not to do. This is why they're looking like this. All right? And so he does this to Jesus. Here's what he says. This is Matthew 27. He says, and, and, let, and let over his head put a charge against him, which read, Jesus, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. In Luke, it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And let it be written in Greek, Latin, and Aramaic, which leads to this question, how big was the sign? It must have been a billboard or something. Well, here's what they would do. They would write the charge in longhand in Greek, and then in the sub-languages, they would put the acrostic. And here's the problem with that. In Aramaic, here's how you say Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Here it is. Yeshua, ha-Nazarite, famelika, ha Yudim. Jesus the Nazarite, the king of the Jews. Now, if you write that as an acrostic, over his head, Pilate wrote, here is yud he vav he if you don't know what that is, that's the highest possible name for God in Hebrew. Here is Yahweh. Here is the Lord. Here is God. So over Jesus is it. Remember the chief priests, they get mad. They go back to Pilate and say, take the sign down, bro. You can't write that. And Pilate's like, well, I've written whatever I've written. Shut up. Go home. It's late. Right? So over Jesus' head, Pilate writes a sign. Here is God. Here is the Lord. Some people name it. Jesus is my Lord. I love God. They can even put it on big signs if they want. They, create, they can create huge social media profiles declaring their love for God. But when you look at their life, they don't know it. Pilate named it, clearly. But when you looked at his life, he used his power, energy, and resources to hurt people instead of serve people. He used his power, energy, and resources to objectify people instead of drawing the best image bearer out of them. Pilate named it, but he doesn't know it. Some people know it. They just can't name it. Other people name it really loud. But when you look at their life, they don't know it. My great-grandfather was illiterate. I'm not mad at him. Nobody taught him to read. My great-grandfather made his living moonshining. If you don't know what that is, that's running illegal liquor across state lines. That has nothing to do with showing your bum, right? Like, wow, he made a living in 1880? Like, <laughs> My great-grandfather was in the Ku Klux Klan. My great-grandfather was an illiterate, moonshining racist. My great-grandfather was on the board of directors at the church. My great-grandfather's full faith was in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to forgive his sins, which evidently were plentiful. My great-grandfather lived in a city where 94% of people went to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. But in the same city, it was illegal for black people to go to white dentists. Think about what ha had to happen for that. The Christian white dentist had to get with the Christian city council who got with the Christian church leaders. And they made a policy that made black people go to vets to get their teeth fixed. Some people name it. But they hardly know it. That's why when... Someone, an 80 year old in Charleston, South Carolina says, we just need to get back to a day we all went to church. You had that, and it was awful for anybody that wasn't white. Why? Because some people know it. They can't name it. Some people name it, 
but they don't know it. Some people have received God's blessing to them, but their offering back isn't very nice. I don't want to be disgusting, but, I, but just spoiler alert, um, crucifixion was disgusting. Um, it was an attempt to dehumanize somebody. That's why we all saw the passion of the Christ once. No, nobody, nobody goes, you know what? I just feel like a good leisurely Friday night viewing of the passion of the Christ. Unless there's something wrong with you. Um, it, it was an attempt to dehumanize somebody. They peg them up 18 inches off the ground. People can spit and mock. It's terrible. But there's this one part of the crucifixion story that never made any sense to me. Because by Roman law, you could not help a crucified person. Like, they, they wouldn't allow them to have any aid. You could mock, spit, scourge, you could do all that, but help, no. And so there's this one part that says, Jesus says, I'm thirsty. Now, what you would expect is for them to go, oh, are you now? Come on, son of God, make some water in your mouth. You turn water into wine, surely. Something mocking, something horrible like that. But they don't. It says that someone found a sponge on a stick soaked with sour wine and vinegar and gave it to him to drink. Here's the actual words. I think someone went and ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. Which is bizarre because that would have been against the law. Um... They wouldn't have let him do that. And so what's going on here? And then not only do they get him something to drink, they get him alcohol, which would have made it better. It's weird. So I took a course on ancient history. Um, the reason is I like learning things. Um, the other reason is I thought it would make me a better pastor. I thought, uh, I thought if I knew first century Roman history, I, it would help me with Philippi, Thessalonica, Galatia, like places like this. And so this, the sixth session of this course, I almost skipped it because... It sounded boring. It's first century Roman hygiene. Um, trust me, the world's better. <laughs> we have soap. Um, uh, the, the Romans were terrible. If, if, we, if we woke up today in first century Galilee, we would throw up in 10 seconds. We'd be dead in three days. Our bodies wouldn't cope. Um, the Romans were horrible. They legalized murder, rape, pedophilia, bestiality, full birth. I mean, they were... Terrible. They enslaved, by conservative estimates, 120 million people out of 170 million people. That's a lot. The world's better. Um, but it wasn't all bad. They did some good things, like modern plumbing. So before the Romans got to Galilee, the Jews, to go to the bathroom, every house had a designated uh, bowl that you went to the toilet in. Don't panic about that. So do you. Every one of your houses has a designated place you go to the bathroom. It's connected to plumbing. It's nice. If somebody came to your bathroom and went to the toilet in the floor, it'd be weird, right? So they, that's, that's what they had, but it was like an actual bowl. Like a, and it was a designated bowl. You'd go to the toilet in the bowl, and then you'd throw it out on the street. So the, the Romans show up, and they're like, what are you, a bunch of animals? Seriously, we solved this problem 120 years ago. And they brought modern plumbing to Israel. So what they did is they built these Roman bathhouses in the middle of these communities. I have an artist's rendition of this. Here it is. Here's an artist's rendition of this kind of bathhouse. Um, as you can see, it's not very private. It, it wasn't gender specific. But this is a massive improvement on pooping in a bowl, right? Um, and it's too close. It's really close. Like, hey, Jim, what do you have for breakfast? Well, you're fixing to find out. I'm telling you, right? So... Is that, you know? And the, the problem was, is how did you clean yourself? Like, what did you do? So there's four options. Fig leaves. Option one. Option two, moss. Option three, your bare left hand. So you would just clean yourself with your bare hand. You'd wash it off as good as you could, which is why in the first century, you would never go, how you going? Right? That was an insult. Um, if, if we were... If we were equal class, oh, as an aside, if we were equal class and we had a problem, I would always hit you with my right hand because it's my clean hand. But if I was a class two and you were a class eight, I'm not hitting you with my right hand. I'm hitting you with my left. It's my unclean hand. It was a, it was a racial, uh, what do you call it, like a, a, a racial slur but done with violence, right? Oh, remember Jesus said, if someone ever slaps you on your right cheek, what do you do? Turn the, yeah. In other words, um, if someone calls you less than human, don't escalate the violence. Just only present the side of you that makes them address you as an equal. Like that. Anyway, so the fourth option uh, were beggars. 
So class nine people, they started a bum wiping service so that you didn't have to dirty your hand. And so what they would do is they'd go collect sponges and put them on sticks. And then if you wanted to use their service, you would just do it, you know, and you'd lean forward. There was room behind you, so you'd lean forward. They'd come up behind you and just, you know, just get right in there, right? So the problem was is, is how, did you, uh, how did you sanitize the sponge? So, so you would, there was a, in, a in, in the Roman bathhouses, there was a bucket uh, with sour wine and vinegar, and they would, they would saturate the sponge that would sanitize it by first century standards. Um, not by our standards, by first century standards. As a matter of fact, if you bring that photo back up, um, as you can see in the guy's hand on, his, on the bottom, he's holding a sponge on a stick, and so are the other ones. Uh, all you have to do, if you don't believe me, is Google um, first century Roman toilet paper, and it's sponges on sticks. As a matter of fact, the second hit you'll get is this picture here. Check this out. Next slide. Next one. Yep. See, the, the, at the bottom there, a sponge stick, the ancient equivalent of toilet paper well known from literary sources. So here's what happened in this story. Jesus is giving his life for that man, and somebody there was cruel enough to go, I know what to get him to drink. And they found a sponge on a stick soaked with sour wine and vinegar and lifted it to his face. What was that? That was the public toilet butt wiper. And what was Jesus' response? Forgive him. Which leads me to all kinds of questions for us. We tend to read the Bible and read ourselves in as the good guys. But just for a second, here's what's happening in this story. Jesus is offering his life for this man. And this man's offering back to him was a dirty Roman sponge. Which leads me to this question. What does our life lifted to Jesus smell like? You could never reciprocate what Jesus did. But does our life's response somehow lift like incense to his nostrils? Or does my anger, my lust, my greed... My tendency to call people idiots, my apathy, is that lifting up? Does the, does the, the, the scent of my life, does it go up as a sweet-smelling incense, or is it a dirty Roman sponge? I have a few questions, because great sermons aren't meant to be agreed with nor disagreed with. They're meant to be wrestled with. So let, let's, let's ask a few questions. Next slide. When ministering in a multicultural context, can we assume that Christ has been at work before we got there? That Christ is already in southern Spain and at work in people in southern Spain. So anything like Numa's bringing Jesus to southern Spain, no way! Jesus is already at work in the people of southern Spain. And what Numa's job is to go help them name what's been going on in them all along. Otherwise, we'll look down on them. One of my favorite Hebrew words is the word kased. Kased is loving kindness. It's God's intent to treat people as they are worth despite what they might deserve. It, 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 this, this story convicts me about the limits I put on Jesus' love for people. Oh, Jesus wouldn't love you because of what, or Jesus wouldn't love you. Wait, hang on. In this story, this guy's response to Jesus is to lift a Roman sponge to his face. And Jesus' response was, I still forgive you. Still forgive you. Now go be inspired by that. We're not supposed to believe in that. Demons believe. We're supposed to allow that to fundamentally shape the way we see our whole world. Let's say it this way. Next slide. If, if my life is an incense offering, what does it smell like? How's my anger? Jesus said six things in dangerous of hell. Anger, lust, calling people idiots. Pride, apathy, and greed. How's my, how's, does, does the offering of my life look like I'm here to serve people or I'm here for them to serve me? Does the offering of my life, how about my anger? When Jesus looks at how I treated that person who came against me, does, what, what does that look like? Um, maybe we could summarize that in one sentence. Jesus has given his life for us. What will our offering be back to him? Does our life have an appropriate response to his great love. Um, I, I thought about how to end this. And um, I'm very fearful of ending it the way I'm gonna do it. Here's the reason why. Worship 
and exaltation is not singing. It's surrender. That worship in here means nothing if it doesn't translate to a life of love out there. Jesus said it this way. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that there's not peace between you and a brother, first go and be reconciled and then come back. In other words, what good does it do you to worship with all your heart in here if all the world sees is us in conflict out there? Um, Exaltation is a moment where we remind ourselves of his place and ours and then hopefully that changes the way we see our whole world. So it's my last point in the sermon. I'd like you to stand because you've been sitting long enough. And I'd like us to consider, where have I named it but don't know it? And what is my offering back? We're gonna have a moment, a brief moment of exaltation and love to put Jesus in his rightful place.